started. So good afternoon and welcome to this lecture sponsored by the Institute of World Politics. For those of you who are new, IWP is a graduate school of national security, intelligence, and international affairs. We offer a doctoral program, seven master's degree programs, including two online MAs, and 18 certificates of graduate study. If you're interested in learning about more about us, please feel free to speak to one of our staff at the conclusion of this event or visit iwp.edu. On behalf of IWP, I would like to thank all of our supporters who make IWP events possible. To support the mission of IWP, please visit iwp.edu forward slash donate. Today we'll be hearing from Mr. Dave Horvath, who will deliver a lecture entitled Private Investment as a Critical Support to U.S. National Security. Dave Horvath graduated from the U.S. Military Academy at West Point in 2009. After graduating, Dave served 10 years on active duty, first as a Ranger Qualified Field Artillery Officer and Military Intelligence Officer, and later as a Special Operations Officer. With extensive service overseas, after transitioning from active duty, Dave pursued his MBA at the University of Michigan Ross School of Business and embarked on a career in strategy consulting, private equity, and now late stage technology investing at Disruptive, an Austin, Texas-based growth equity firm. Dave currently leads the Washington DC office for Disruptive, in addition to a large portion of the firm's national security and dual use technology portfolio. With that, please join me in welcoming Dave Horvath. Thank you very much, Carlos, for this gracious introduction. And thank you, everyone here tonight. It's uh, truly a pleasure to be here and to be amongst uh, the many professionals, uh, particularly with a shared love for IWP. Uh, IWP's mission is, is one that's very near and dear to my heart as a former national security professional and current uh, reserve officer who uh, still, is, still cares very deeply uh, about promoting uh, US national interests domestically and abroad. Uh, IWP's mission is important, uh, and again, you know, very excited to, uh, to be here to, to support that tonight. Um, Carlos covered a, a good portion of, of my background, and just to, to go through that a little bit and provide some context to this evening's discussion, um, as he indicated, pursued a, a career as an Army officer through West Point, uh, and, and during my service, uh, as, which was a little over 10 years, particularly when I was working within Special Operations, I gained a, a unique perspective as a consumer and a customer of non-standard uh, commercial technology as, as a means to uh, execute our missions, uh, varied as they may be. And that was really the first leg of a three-legged chair, if you will, in terms of uh, getting to the perspective and, and position in which uh, I currently sit. Uh, as I proceeded through and, and got off active duty, went and identified the private sector as something I'd like to pursue next. Um, when I was at, at business school, uh, and again, just to, to double down, we're, we're merely a week removed from uh, a national championship, so I, I'd be remiss if I didn't say a hearty go blue. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> excuse any Spartan graduates uh, in, in attendance or other Big Ten fans. Um, moving into my, my next chapter as a, within the private sector, I had an opportunity to work within private equity and then uh, spent a couple of years in strategy consulting here uh, within Washington, the Washington DC uh, nexus. And that's really where I was able to uh, acquire and develop that second leg of the chair, understanding and identifying how the private sector and the government work together uh, to, again, promote those uh, US national security and, and, and national interests. Um, after about two years within uh, the consulting space, I had an opportunity to join my current firm, Disruptive, as Carlos indicated. Uh, and, and embarked upon a, a, a career within the, the late stage investing space. And, and really what I focus on is uh, defense technology, aerospace and defense as it's commonly referred to, and really what the common and, and current parlance is uh, dual use technology, and that being technology that's got application both in the government space, but also within the commercial market. So as I got into the seat at Disruptive uh, at the beginning of last year, opened our DC office, uh, I was able to further develop a, a new lens, and I'm, I'm very pleased to share that with you this, this evening. Uh, and so title of the, the talk tonight is, is Private Investment as, as that Critical Support to U.S. National Security. And it's a natural question as to, to really what does that mean, and particularly why now. First and, and foremost, 
is, is a, something that cuts both ways, both excitingly and, and also uh, to a certain degree concerningly, is that uh, the U.S. And, and the world is at an inflection point as it relates to technology and the technology's uh, application with uh, national security concerns. And, and the first sub-element of that is, is that we're no longer in a unipolar or bipolar uh, stat status where the U.S. has a, a far and away lead over a singular competitor or, or it, itself alone. Because of a number of factors I'll touch on tonight is that multipolar environment has, has created a, 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 an environment, again to use that word, where those near-peer adversaries that we'd referred to for a long time throughout uh, the last 20 odd years of, of fighting a global war on terror, those near peers uh, in some cases are, are now peers or are very, very much legitimate competitors. And as we look at you know, those no longer ankle biting uh, type of concerns, those, those true threats from a near peer standpoint, we look at, at competitors like Russia um, speaks for itself in terms of their influence and, and ability to operate uh, and conduct operations across uh, the, you know, Europe and Eastern and Central Europe but also throughout the Middle East and, and cause challenges for America and our allies uh, through their own uh, allied relationships with, with adversaries of ours. We look at uh, the People's Republic of China and not only their ability to expand their power base across the South China Sea and East Asia, but truly across the developing world through things like the Belt and Road Initiative. We look at Iran, uh, a regional player and, and, and significant element of power within the Middle East, uh, but, but also their ability to conduct external operations through their uh, proxies across the, the, the global landscape. We look at North Korea, which you know, continues to be a, a challenging player, uh, a source of havoc across uh, East Asia, but also uh, they, uh, the president and, and uh, his administration over there is, is often want to uh, expand that havoc across the global landscape through a, a number of means. And, and finally, uh, non-state actors, uh, both those who are backed by the aforementioned uh, great powers, but also independent uh, like ISIS and, and others. Um, we, we look at a, an environment where there's a, a great deal of threat from a number of perspectives, leading into the second point, which is democratization of, of technology development. Previously, um, this was, was something that was close held to, to state actors, but now we, we're in a position where there's a dire need to rapidly innovate again. And which, it's critical to our national defense, whereas the legacy model of these Leviathan uh, players, large prime contractors that can take years and decades to develop critical technology, that model is no longer valid. Wars and competition are won over weeks, months, at the most years now, and no longer those, those longer time horizons. So all that to say, you know, we've, we've gotten to a current state and would like to discuss how we got here. Uh, and given that we're in an academic environment, I would be remiss if I didn't touch, uh, provide a, a, a slight history lesson here. So uh, we'll touch on that briefly uh, you know, in, in terms of how we got here. And, and where I'd like to focus in particular is the home of U.S. innovation um, for you know, a, a great deal of time, and that being uh, Silicon Valley. Counterintuitively in the modern era, Silicon Valley uh, was actually founded upon government and private innovation working together to, to further American aims against the, uh, the threat of the Soviet Union. And so as we, um, we look at, at the origins of Silicon Valley, there, there are key individuals that I'd like to, to touch on and, and, and not necessarily deep dive, but dive into a little bit that are on both sides of that government and, and private fence. The first individual I'd like to discuss is, is Vannevar Bush. Uh, Vannevar Bush was the right hand to President Roosevelt through uh, World War II. He himself, was an accomplished inventor. He invented uh, the differential analyzer, which is the precursor to the modern computer. And he was that uh, learned voice in, in Roosevelt's ear uh, to promote government and private innovation through the war and, and apropos of this discussion tonight, after the war in founding Silicon Valley and attracting talent from places like MIT and others out to North Central California where this new nexus was being formed. He later founded the National Science Foundation. And as I said, he himself is, is a uh, an accomplished uh, technological mind, but also was a critical uh, plank holder in terms of pushing forward government and, and private sector innovation. The second individual I'd like to, to discuss is President Eisenhower, who is no stranger um, to, I'm sure, the studies of IWP. Uh, I have a great deal of respect for him, not only as a West Point grad, but also as, a <laughs> as an army officer, statesman, and just a, a tremendous president himself. His critical role was, established, was signing into action the establishment of ARPA, the Advanced Research Projects Agency, now known as DARPA, Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. 
And the criticality of, of DARPA, ARPA, now DARPA, is that that was an agency that further attracted talent. It, it moved forward the, the proverbial football and allowed America to continue to move, establish, and, and build upon gains within the technological space. And it attracted the new players to, the, to Silicon Valley while also concurrently creating technology that had deep impact to, uh, to the civilian uh, populace within America and really changed America for the better. So as we look at, at the role that DARPA played, and, and thanks to uh, Vannevar Bush and President, and President Eisenhower, we, we, I just want to talk through, you know, DARPA created things like the internet, the graphic user interface, something that we take for granted as just a computer screen now. And then attracting talent like Lockheed Martin as one example, but many different uh, prime contractors that are common parlance. If you drive down 395, you see all kinds of logos uh, these days. But the importance of attracting talent like Lockheed Martin was that it allowed and continued to push, push forward that football, develop new game-changing technology, allowed us to continue our advance, continue that lead, and, and push forward toward winning the, the Cold War as we did. The, the latter part of this slide I want to point to is the fact that this technological innovation then subsequently attracted logos that might be further counterintuitive to this discussion, the Googles, the Amazons, Facebook, and, and myriad other technological talent. Because what it afforded is a place for resident domestic talent to cut their teeth in support of an important mission, develop those skill sets, and then continue to iterate and innovate in, within the civilian space. And so as we move forward along this time horizon, and the, the Cold War came to a close, the, the wall fell, defense didn't necessarily become unfashionable. But the, the incumbent firms that we, we mentioned, uh, they became bloated. The, the government acquisition and development process itself became lengthier and more arduous. And we entered a period where true innovation was no longer table stakes to, to winning wars. We, we got through the, cold, excuse me, the, uh, the Gulf War. We got through the Balkan era. And, and, and candidly, once we got into the global war on terror, that continued to further that trend. And what really emerged was it's commonly called the Valley of Death. And what that is, is it's when you look at a, a earlier stage startup that's trying to, particularly within the government tech and defense tech space, trying to solve problems, there is such a need for capital injection that if they don't get it, they, it's easy for the effort to die in the vine because of these larger players that are in, incumbent, able to, to a certain degree, solve a problem, albeit on a lengthier time horizon. But those smaller players will just die within this valley of death. And that's what, what came out of the post-Cold War era and was furthered of, of, over the, the subsequent 30 years. So really, at bottom line is that the incentive to innovate evaporated. And so as we move forward, we, the question naturally is, is where are we now? So we're coming off of 20 plus years of, of hard-fought counterterrorism. And I don't mean to minimize the global war on terror at, at all. I, I myself am, am a veteran of, of various conflicts within the, the GWAT and beyond. And I'm sure many others are here today lots of sacrifice and, and very challenging 20 years. But in terms of, of the technological innovation side of things, we were fighting against a largely unsophisticated adversary. And as a result, again, those, there was no longer table stakes to continue to push that true innovation and solving hard problems in order to win on the battlefield. And so what happened is, is we as a, a national apparatus rested on our laurels from a technological standpoint. And as we look at, um, uh, conflicts that emerged, we were caught on our heels. So again, we look at Russia, Ukraine, when that kicked off in, in 22, we, what we've seen since is, is massive innovation on the battlefield at the tactical and operational level. But what we didn't have is resident uh, knowledge, resident skill sets, whether it be, uh, or just resident technology that was already in development, able to be uh, put forth and, and, and not shared, but, but utilized on the battlefield for immediate effect against the, the Russian aggressor. And as such, there's been a requirement to continue to rapidly, rapidly innovate, and, and sadly, at the, uh, the cost of a great deal of lives uh, and a, a furthering of that conflict. As we look at, at uh, the PRC, the People's Republic of China aggression, staying away from South China Sea and, and their Belt and Road side of things, what we've seen is, is a great deal of state-sponsored state innovation. Because candidly, if, if a piece of technology touches mainland China, it, the Chinese government effectively owns it, or at least has direct access to it. And as a result, there has been a, an opportunity for PRC to continue to close in on, on America and, and close that lead that we had held for so long. And lastly, and, and most uh, 
you know, contemporary, is we, we look at uh, the, the current conflict within the Red Sea and the, the, the contested Bab al-Mandeb uh, Simi uh, Strait. We, we see the Houthis, which are very clearly Iranian-backed, they're able to, because of this democratization and lower barrier to entry to, to technology, they're able to make a substantial impact from a global standpoint, rerouting shipping lanes and creating myriad problems for, uh, for their adversaries, which is ourselves and our allies. So again, what, what we're seeing is the lowest technological barrier to entry in history, and tragically, paired with the, the greatest threat profile. And what I mean by that is for, for a long time, only the, the nuclear option was viewed as this cataclysmic threat that struck fear across the globe, let alone America and our allies. And, and for, for the, as long as that was the only uh, great threat, that's, it was a, a result of the fact that only nation states could, could really perpetrate that threat. Uh, they had the infrastructure, they had the talent, they had the capital, and they had the, the means to deliver um, a, you know, a, a nuclear uh, attack. However, as we move forward, and again, this, this lowered technological barrier to entry, two domains that were previously also held only by nation state actors have, have been made available to, uh, and again, more democratized. And those two domains are, are the cyberspace domain and the, and the space domain itself. For a long time, again, through the Cold War and, and really through the, the 90s and early 2000s, the only way to, to have effect within either of those, those domains was to be backed by a true nation state actor. Um, but what we've seen now is that barrier to technological entry has, has been lowered. Really all one needs at, in the current state is a, a laptop like this, uh, some technical acumen and access to infrastructure to really have massive effect that in some cases, depending on the target and, and the way an attack is perpetrated, uh, could be on par with that nuclear threat. And, and to me and, and to many, that's, that's a, a very frightening specter. So, Natural question, uh, I've, I've given a, a, a brief history lesson, I've talked about uh, you know, the, the global landscape, tying it back to the purpose of tonight's discussion and, and the relevance of private investment. How does it help to solve that problem? How does it drive innovation with national security implications? And, and the first point is, is that we're at a time where that rapid and effective innovation in, in its truest form are necessary. And, and they're tables, again, I've used this term a lot, they're table stakes to establish a competitive edge. And, and private investment at, at its base demands results. Within the private market, if, if a product fails, that's, there's, there's no excuse for that. There's no, um, we'll call it a safety net as, that might exist within uh, you know, government produced tech where if something fails, well, it's just you know, an additional line on, on the balance sheet. When there's, there's private capital behind an effort, there are consequences to that. And so applying that to the government space, uh, I, I propose is, is, the, is the best option. And so at, at its base, America was built on that capitalistic model of where the best product and best positioning wins. So applying that is to the national security space is a way to win again. You know, a, a po another positive ancillary of that is that it forces streamlining of development of tech. Again, non-organically, uh, you know, government-based tech or government-originated uh, tech differs from this in that there's, there's no safety net. Some of the, uh, many of these startups, countless startups in the private space provide that opportunity to really streamline development, get a product to market faster and better because there's private capital behind it. Secondly, it positively influences innovation um, across the government apparatus. And I don't mean just within the technical stack. These practices from the private sector are only positive in how they can, they can influence and help to de-bloat um, the, the process and, and bureaucracies that have emerged over the past 20 to 30 years. Third, it, it's hearkening it, back to the early days of Silicon Valley. It, it creates domestic jobs. It develops talent among younger employees. Again, what we saw that grew into the Googles, the Amazons, the Facebooks of the world. And, and it creates positive ancillaries for civilian use cases. There's, there's new opportunities to have spin-offs, again, within this dual use model that can positively affect the, the consumer market and the, and the American public writ large. Now, I, what I've talked about thus far is, is a lot of maybe doom and gloom, maybe you know, a, a pessimistic or hyper-realistic view of the world. Uh, but I, I, I do want to point the, to the way that the U.S. government is, is meeting uh, the private sector halfway here and, and making some tremendous gains. Uh, the first being the way that the Defense Department has reshaped the way it, it sees innovation and way, the way it, it prosecutes innovation in support of its own aims. We have uh, Defense Department level innovation organizations like the Defense Innovation Unit reporting directly to Secretary of Defense and solving those hard problems 
that exist across the, the department writ large. So, not necessarily subordinate, but working hand in hand are service level organizations. You have the Army's 75th Innovation Command. You've got uh, Naval X, uh, Air Force's AF Works, and a number of other service-based organizations that solve those problems for the respective service working hand in hand with the department. We have the, the Pentagon's Office of Strategic Capital, which is a, a very new office and a very exciting one, particularly from, from my perspective as an investor, where the, the Pentagon is approaching sources of private capital to seek investment in critical technology areas. And, and that's very exciting to me because it harkens back to those, those values of Silicon Valley where we saw success, where we, where we saw so much uh, exciting innovation. And, and it's, it's very refreshing to me to see the Pentagon make these, these, uh, these great strides. And, and lastly, we have innovations, uh, excuse me, initiatives like Project Replicator and so many others. Uh, Kathy Hicks, uh, an undersecretary, uh, started Project Replicator as a, as a way to bring in private technology that's, again, venture-backed, uh, to really make game-changing strides on the battlefield, particularly as it relates to autonomy. And in doing so, saving American lives, furthering American aims, and, and meeting our end states at a greater success rate with lower cost. And so moving forward, you know, the nat another natural question is what's next? Where are we going? And, and so from, from my perspective, I just indicated momentum is, is truly strong and building across this landscape. And there's two halves to that momentum. The first being those startups that are, are venture backed, are private capital backed, that are, are breaking the mold on, on what success looks like, getting back to those early days of Silicon Valley. Startups like Shield AI, which are producing game-changing autonomy suites. Uh, Anderil, which uh, a company that is, is often in the news most recently, creating and in, in integrating environments uh, you know, for a variety of autonomy uh, solutions. Shift 5, as I indicated, the cyberspace domain is one where there is an opportunity or an outstanding threat for truly cataclysmic events. And, and Shift 5 is, is a company that, again, is, is private capital backed and they are looking at innovative ways to, to work hardware and software together to identify and mitigate those threats in real time. And so the other half of that, of that momentum is, is the investment side, the private capital side. And there's a tremendous amount of energy there. We have firms like mine, Disruptive. We have other firms like Point72, Steve Cohen's uh, firm that you know, has dived headlong into uh, defense tech investment. We've got firms like Snowpoint. And then we have other larger firms like Sequoia and Andreessen Horowitz, which previously were, were consumer focused uh, in, in the large scale, but have identified a market opportunity. And, and they themselves have a dedication to a mission, particularly Andreessen, which has its own initiative, American Dynamism, which is rallying and, and marshalling forces, per se, uh, behind technology that's going to, to further American aims, which is truly refreshing. And so, you know, speaking to the, you know, the attendees tonight, a number of whom uh, are, are students here at IWP, I also wanted to, to talk to opportunities within the, the, the finance and investment space as it relates to a post-government career and what I've seen from my optic. And, and it might sound counterintuitive, uh, you know, the, the natural trajectory often is, is a, a very lengthy and, and successful career where it culminates as a, a general officer, flag officer, or an SES or a GS-15 and, and naturally will flow into a board seat on one, on one of the number of primes, uh, prime defense contractors, which is a completely uh, respectable and, and admirable uh, way to, to move into post-government service. But what I'd like to suggest is, is an opportunity to, to use skill sets that you might not realize you have now and, and a, get into the weeds, get your hands dirty, because you know, there, there are a number of different skill sets that are, I've noticed are, are very applicable to this space, particularly understanding that customer need. As I indicated, that's, that's one thing I drew from my active duty service, is under, being on that tip of the spear, understanding where those shortfalls are, where the opportunities, where the challenges are, and bringing that to bear in, in private markets. Second is, is a patriotic passion. You know, for, for the U.S. And, and for allies, and that's critical as as this momentum is continued and, and furthered and, and grown in the space to to advance this critical tech. Third is the ability to manage relationships and understand centers of gravity. In in this in this space within the the investment and finance world, understanding and managing relationships, building meaningful relationships, is is far and away one of the most important skill sets. And lastly is is retooling 
the, the skills of intelligence and operational analysis for due diligence. Uh, one thing I didn't realize before I got into the space is, is due diligence is really just intelligence analysis with, you know, gone through a washer and, and, and retooled. And, and taking those skill sets and bring, bringing them to bear is, is, some, is a massive opportunity and, and something that could be very attractive uh, as a post-government career. So to conclude, what does all this mean? To me, the, the table is set and, and there's an opportunity for America to reemerge as the far and away leader of global tech and as it relates particularly to, to security at the global scale. There's demand signal from the investment community. There, we've got resident domestic talent that I, I discussed. And, and the government, to its credit, has shifted gears to remove friction from the process, remove red tape and bureaucracy, and, and allow truly meaningful tech to, to be brought to bear. It really just needs continued pressure and consistent effort to stay at the table and collaborate for the best inter interests of America, both domestically and abroad. So as I conclude, I'd like to open it up for uh, any, any questions or, or comments from, uh, from attendees here tonight. I, th I think there is. Uh, from, from my optic, I've already seen it. There's, uh, there's an understanding and a realization that up until this point, for over the, the recent past, it has been uh, not deprioritized, but not the priority that it should have been for, for truly meaningful and, and game-changing innovation. But to, to the, the credit of U.S. government, and this is immaterial of who's in the White House, but over the past four to eight years, we've seen a number of ways to, to take slack out of the process, uh, and allow these really meaningful areas of uh, examples of technology to, to move forward, to get past that valley of death, which tragically you know, has, has taken the lives of, of many opportunities in the past, um, and, and allow that to come to fruition and, and get to the battlefield or get to the, the world stage for that interstate competition and, and applicability. Oh. Yes. Um, yes. So mentioned that the government has changed the acquisition process to meet the demands of people trying to enter the marketplace. Um, I, I guess this would have two questions. And one, do you feel like there's further changes in the acquisition process that need to take place to incentivize entry to the defense industry? Um, and then two, where do you feel like starting companies can meet the government in the middle there? Which which companies do you see making the, having the most success in entering an acquisition process that still has securitized red tape? Sure, so I understand there, there are two questions there. First is opportunity for improvement. Sure, opportunity for improvement in the acquisition process. Mm -hmm. And then two, noting the improvements that have already been made, what can companies do to most successfully meet the government where it's at right now? Sure, I, I think to the first question, uh, speaking in general terms, there's always improvements that can be made. There are, we're, we're part way into a, a, a race, uh, using that as a, as a, a metaphor, to, to get to where we need to be in terms of realizing the opportunity for, for private tech uh, within the defense and national security space. Without getting into details, there are still areas of slack within the, uh, the, the government acquisition process that need to be taken out. But to, to be also fair uh, to the other side, that, that takes time. That takes, you know, there are cycles that, that occur in terms of changing uh, processes. So, Yes, there's opportunity, but I've seen a lot of, of encouraging and, and meaningful progress thus far. In terms of your second question, I think taking advantage of, of new contracting mechanisms, uh, especially in the SIBR and, and SITR space, the small business innovation research space, those across all services and across the department writ large, those are opportunities to get on the, the main stage and in front of the Defense Department to exhibit uh, technology for, for, the, for the right eyes. And, and, and to, my, to address it in relation to one of my, my later points, it's having people on the team that know the right centers of gravity to, to address and, and execute with. Because the government, even, even though it is a, a large behemoth in terms of a, a great deal of bureaucracy, it is still personality based. So understanding where those proper uh, centers of gravity lie uh, is, is another critical uh, element for a, a private company to, to see success in the government space. Private investment requires a return. Mm -hmm. 
and a return can imply in a global economy the blurring of the lines between government specific and black market or gray market mm -hmm. distribution of a product. We have a we, we have a circumstance now where any bunch of bad guys in a cave can get the most sophisticated drones. Right. What's the role of the private sector in creating the walls or barriers so that the stuff created doesn't fall over into a global black market? I think the, the first step is early engagement with between like now whether that's from the investment side, whether it's from the startup side or from the, the government side. And those I'm gonna touch on each each one of those three pillars. As we look at the, the, the investment side, that's maintaining, well, use myself as, a, as an example, that's maintaining relationships between myself and my counterparts, uh, either in uniform or at least in, in, the, uh, in the apparatus, and understanding where the red lines are and, and where we cannot influence or advise our, our portfolio companies to, to operate. The second being from the portfolio company or the, the, the startup standpoint is further engagement there and, and going after some of the contract mechanisms that I just, I just spoke to and, and from a very early standpoint establishing those meaningful relationships at the product level, which because of these advancements that, that my colleagues and I have seen thus far, that early engagement is no longer a, a death knell to, okay, well now they're hooked up to the government and it might die in the vine. Now because of a, a change in culture and a change of apparatus, that early engagement means that it could afford meaningful engagement and done the right way. And third, if sp flipping over to the government side, and, and to the credit of, of we'll use just de Defense Department as, as an example, entities like Defense Innovation Unit, like the Army's 75th Innovation Command, having tech scouts on staff themselves seeking out new, new opportunities and, and building those relationships from the other side of the coin is, is really the, the way to see success there. And so trust is at the base of it. It is. It, trust in, and building that into something meaningful. A, a trans, no, no longer a transactional relationship, but a transformational relationship because of the true upside. Yeah. Yes, sir. firms working with parts of the government units together and who does what? Can you, uh, can you clarify your question a little bit? Uh, okay, uh, you just gave an example of one of the labs that was doing something mm -hmm. and uh, how is that working? Uh, yes, when I, when I uh, you're talking about Army Applications Lab and that type of thing. So those are, that's a, an example of a, a government, uh, an office lab being more of a general term, not necessarily white coats and, and, uh, and clean rooms. They, that's part of it, but, <laughs> but uh, as it relates to, uh, we'll use Army Applications Lab as, as an example. Um, the way that works is, as I indicated, there are tech scouts that are either active duty or reservists, and they themselves are, are charged with, with the duty of seeking out, whether it be at attending conferences, cold reach out, or outreach, excuse me, um, and, and building those relationships themselves uh, in support of, of Army aims because you know, the Army or Navy or Air Force, whatever the case, whatever service, stands to benefit if they have access to a, you know, a piece of techno meaningful technology early. Um, so I'm trying to answer your question as best, best I understand it, um, but that's one of many examples where Naval X is another one from the Navy's perspective. Again, they, they have uniformed personnel that are charged with going out and seeking, seeking out this, this new tech before, before someone else does. It's, it's getting in early and often um, to build that relationship. Yes. Uh, Mike Eastwood from Heron in Washington. What about the case where the private enterprise is an individual who has become so rich and powerful that he controls some particular enterprise? And the example would be Elon Musk and the Starlink satellite system. So you, you said what about, can you? Good or bad or con controllable? In, in terms of controllable, I think that can go a lot of different directions, so I'd like to avoid that term. But I think it's, it's, it's being upfront and, and a allowing any individual, I'm not going to, to, to speak to Mr. Musk himself, but any individual with means, opportunity, and, and placement and access to operate within the bounds of, 
of the, the apparatus and, and, and regulation. But if there's an, an overstep um, outside of that, it's, it's holding a, it's a accountability. Um, and again, I think I, I, I'm harkening back to this, this same point over and over, but it's because I, I believe in it. It's, it's building a relationship where there's trust inherent to um, person A or entity A and entity B, and an understanding of if entity A or B operates outside the bounds, there are consequences there. So I think, is it good or bad? That's, I, I, I think it could cut either way, but I think there's opportunity there in terms of an individual who has a desire to develop and produce truly meaningful technology in support of our, our mission and, and understanding those, those hard bounds and, and managing incentives appropriately. Sure. No, I appreciate that question. To, to speak to the exciting tech where there's a great deal of demand, there are a lot of, of sub-verticals uh, that we can point to. I think the, one of the most pointed um, or, or most exciting is, is the autonomy space, which understanding AI has, is having its moment right now uh, from a number of perspect perspectives and, and uh, additional diligence is often required to make sure that if there's a dot AI at the end of something, it's, it's, tr it's truly meaningful, but I think autonomy as it relates to government tech uh, is one of, the, one of the most exciting spaces uh, where I'm always eager to, to have a conversation and, and dig into because there's, there are so many myriad opportunities. And that's, that's not just on the battlefield, that's automation of logistics or, or, or personnel movement or anything under the sun you can imagine. Taking the, the American service member out of the equation while still being able to get the mission completed, but keeping a human in the loop to be, to be careful. We're not trying to make a Skynet here. <laughs> but, uh, but that's most exciting to me because, candidly, I've, I've buried enough friends you know, because of being on the battlefield and, and, and actions that happen there and, and events that happen there that seeing an opportunity to remove that from the equation, still getting the mission done in a, in a responsible manner, that's what's most exciting to me. Uh, to your second question, where, where to look and, and where to present yourself as, as a you know, candidate. To me, it's, there's the, the sports adage of hanging around the hoop and, and identifying firms that themselves have a, a defined thesis within the defense or dual use space, um, whether it's they, they have a, a veteran cohort within their staff or they, they've identified that. And, and like I said, in the case of uh, Sequoia or Andreessen, um, not naturally in the space, but they've identified that as a market opportunity. So I think culling, if, if you as a, are a candidate trying to, to move into the space, culling down the list of, of firms that you're focused on where you can speak to a particular way you can support their uh, chartered mission, per se, or their, 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 their thesis, that's the way to get on the radar, is say, you know, I, I see that you're not only a defense investor, but you're, you're focused on counter UAS and, and ancillary tech that way. Well, based on my experience as it relates to XYZ, I can demonstrate value here and let's have a conversation. Does that help? Yep. Thank you. Uh, yes, Ambassador Hollow. You are giving us a 21st century presentation and I must say I'm impressed by it. I'm encouraged by it. I have worried about some of these things. But I want to ask you a 20th century question. Okay. It's apparent in Ukraine that the Russian industrial base is at its max. Mm -hmm. They're having to import drones from Iran and artillery sure. shells from North Korea. With our highly dispersed supply chain, mm -hmm. is our industrial base able to handle a full-scale war at this time? I think there are outstanding challenges that we would need to address uh, before embarking upon 
uh, that type of conflict. And I'm confident, if not certain, those conversations are already happening. I, I'll say I'm, I'm certain they're happening because I've been in the rooms for a couple of myself, uh, in the room for a couple of those myself. Uh, logis you know, there, there's the adage that, that tactics and infantry wins battles, logistics wins wars. I think there's a realization, I know there's been a realization of retooling and, and restructuring our, our logistics uh, base and our, our strategic sourcing to, to tackle that. And I don't want to speak to the, the, where it is in terms of status of, ach of achieving that mission, but I, I know that wheels are turning to, to address that as a, as a critical need. We have one over here. Yes. So going off that, just so that you can, mm -hmm. um, so I just follow up with this, what first thing that you need to do is to build um, dynamic and manageable and to do these things that AI is a lot of attention to. Sure. That's a lot of money to build muscles and build that. And pick up the slack and you know, you need to do that. And that first is to set. But going back to the Ukraine war right now, what we're seeing is a, a relatively symmetrical conflict and going back to the fundamental aspects of the most efficient way to kill your enemy is what wins the war. Mm -hmm. And so when your sole basis of making money on the kinetic side of things is selling to the government itself, that really heightens the, the risk and limits the avenue for reward for basic kinetic munitions. And I'm curious what avenues of approach you have to make sure that that uh, investment isn't being stifled by fear of uh, uh, lost effort. So to, to clarify, to ensure I'm, I, I have your question properly captured, you're asking what's being done to ensure that we're not focusing on the wrong tech, or? Well, too isolated in tech. I mean, like I said, there's the newest, greatest thing that you brought up is AI. I think that the, the cheapest, most efficient way is then we get the good off the battlefield and still the functions the way we win wars. And so, as you brought up earlier, I mean, we, we can make cheap aluminum domes that are made out of fiberglass that are largely um, aged effectively by dodging a lot of the uh, anterior and bicuspid there. Mm -hmm. Sure. So, um, and I'll clarify some previous uh, previous comment when I spoke to autonomy. Um, when I talk about autonomy and, and AI, that's uh, what I want to underline is a broad application thereof. So, when speaking to the the very basic bullet or other munition removing an enemy from the battlefield, there are, are broad spanning applications of, of this tech that can improve. I'm loath to use that that term, but enhance that process. Um, of, of a final finish effect. Um, so to, I think to try and answer your question, there is a, a wide variety of tech that, that might on its, its face look like, okay, it's, it's AI, it's, it's another chat GPT or otherwise, but there are use cases where application of, of that tech can massively improve a targeting cycle or a, an intelligence finish cycle uh, to really to still get at um, you know, the, 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 the base goal of, of removing or, or removing from the battlefield or deterring conflict. And so I, I still want to make sure I'm, I'm answering your question, but the applications of, of dual use tech do also delve into the kinetic themselves, um, whether it be s properly sourcing munitions from 762 all the way through howitzers or overlaying autonomy suites such that they're able to target more effectively and, and to your point, remove enemy from the battlefield more effectively. Does that address it? By all means, clarify further. Roughly, it really just seems like the kinetic is going to take a backseat and there's plenty of innovation that can be undertaken and that will run as well. And, you know, it's a high risk thing because if you fail to go ahead and market that to a government or a NATO partner at that point, you can't sell that to a group of force who's driving for a time investment. It, it definitely is a risk, uh, and, and to speak to your point, there, there are a number of, of, of kinetic-focused um, companies that are, that are out there from the, the seed all the way through you know, Series A, Series B stage, um, vying for, for those types of con, you know, contracts and, and, and business. Yeah. Um, one cl clarification and then a quick question. Mm -hmm. The clarification is autonomy, as you're using it, is the application of technology to automate what had previously been a kinetic human activity. Is yes, that correct? That is correct. So you're using it. Mm -hmm. uh, 
to the other gentleman's point, and perhaps Ambassador Hallwell's as well, and at the risk of sounding Luddite, might there be disincentives, economic or otherwise, to the overly complex systems that are now being engaged? My Air Force background led me to believe that the B-2 could actually fly, but we couldn't afford it, and it didn't fly very often. Okay? The world of small arms was revolutionized not by the M-15 or M-16, but by uh, Kalashnikov's AK-47, which could be made anywhere, used anywhere, and mud wouldn't gum it up. Do we, are we at a point where things are so complicated, there's no money to be made unless complication is at the core of it? I wouldn't necessarily say, yes, we're at that point where only overly complicated technical systems are, are the solution to the battlefield. But I think we're at a point where the, the vast majority uh, will, will dominate the market because we're, we're in an age where that is, is what's required to, to win based on offensive, defensive measures that are inherent to, to every battlefield in the modern era. Uh, of course, we, by, by the same token, there are actions and, and threats that can be prosecuted that render technical systems obsolete or you know, at, at very degraded. Um, as a, as a spin-off to that or a, a further ancillary, there's the, the market for defense against those types of, of attacks. I, the company I spoke to before, Ship 5, uh, and, and many others, they're, they're addressing that and attacking that problem. So to answer your question, long story short, long story long, I don't think that the, the opportunity is, is completely gone by the wayside. I think that it is minimized from what it used to be uh, because of the, the demand necessity to operate at you know, a, a higher technical level on the battlefield. To, to, to support kinetic-focused technology? Yeah. I think there's, there will there continue to be a need for it, to, to speak to General White's question. Uh, I, I don't think that that will ever go away, you know, evaporate completely from the battlefield. Uh, I think that if there's a market opportunity, if it, I think once you get into the, the purely kinetic side of things, there, there's an ethics question that often comes up, uh, and, and that's going, it's not a homogenous uh, type of characterization, that's going to vary firm to firm. And it's, uh, it's going to depend on the appetite and, and desire of limited partners, the investors behind firms that, that invest in those, um, those solutions, their comfort level with, uh, with that type of technology, and fitting within the thesis of, of whatever firm might be. So I think, and I know for a fact, <coughs> peer firms that I deal with, um, do have an appetite and a desire to continue to invest in the kinetic space, and I think there, there will continue to be a market there. Um, so I, to answer your question as I, as I understand it, uh, I, I do think that that's still an investable sub-vertical going forward. I, I, yes, thank you for the clarification. I, I understand what you're getting at now. Uh, yes, it's far, we'll use the, the term left of boom. Operating currently far left of boom, there are a, a variety of investment firms and startups that are, are focused on either directly supporting kinetic efforts or improving the, the systems and, and processes with which to deliver those kinetic effects. So um, that investment and, and that development is, is existing already. Uh, so to answer your question, I, I believe that that's something that will continue to operate with foresight.
Yes. And then you get into the, get, like you, you touched on this already, but getting the military DOD to procure those systems and yes. that is a convoluted and long process. And can you comment any just generally on the, the budget making process inside the DOD and the NDAA and, and getting lobbyists for some of these firms or investment firms that, to kind of bring it in front of Congress say, hey, this is what's important and necessary because of the long development uh, period for some of these complex systems and, and looking over the horizon to, to the next uh, risk that, that we face with these myriad adversaries. Sure. To, to speak to a, an answer I provided a few moments ago, there have been a, a great deal of strides made to improve that process. And there's, there's still opportunity to improve it further. Uh, when it comes to a, you know, a, a piece of tech or, or the firm that's developing that to to actually get it to fielding through the procurement process, the best, or from my optic, the best best way to do that is utilizing these contract vehicles that have have been either ex in existence and moth, you know previously mothballed and brought back to life, or created anew over the the last three to five years. And so, in the in the case of you know, XYZ company producing ZYX widget getting in early and often, attacking these you know, small business innovation research grants and, and getting in front of the proper, uh, not necessarily policymakers, but the um, procurement individuals to, to help them understand the tech, help truncate that process as much as possible. Um, yes, as, as I indicated a moment ago, there's, there's still opportunity to, to truncate that. And there are, are a variety of entities, both from the lobbying side and, and just investment firms and, and, and tech firms in general that are working to try and improve that process. Um, but from the, the standpoint of, of a startup trying to, to get all the way through procurement, best way to do it is, is take advantage of some of these early um, you know, advancements in that, in that process. I think if, if, from my perspective, and not speaking on behalf of any organization I am currently or was formerly a part of, I think if it's more of a, uh, if you swap the chicken and the egg of, of that question, in response to an outstanding challenge, development and adoption uh, of these technical solutions that can multi, you know, service force, force multipliers or serve in place of, of humans on the battlefield, I think that's, that's where the opportunity lies. In terms of trying to replace ahead of a recruiting challenge, I, I don't necessarily see it that way. But in the, the advent of a, a challenge that is existing right now and may exacerbate, that's where some of these particularly autonomy solutions might um, serve to, to fill that gap. Not completely, but it serve as a, a support mechanism such that we're still able to, to conduct you know, and execute our mission. Well, thank you very much for, for your attention this evening. It's been a true pleasure. <laughs>